We continue on in our series of First Peter, and we come to this uh, very appropriate, very timely passage about having joy in the midst of trials. Uh, I hope that you're getting as much out of this uh, First Peter series as I am. Uh, and this passage actually fits the theme of uh, Palm Sunday, uh, as we celebrate a humble king who suffered and who conquered suffering. Many of you know the grief and loss with which my family has, has uh, been dealing with over these last few days. And so this passage on joy in the midst of trial has become more personal, more real to me, taking on a new power. How do we have joy in the midst of trials? All of us seek to root our joy in something, often uh, earthly, temporal things which don't last and don't ultimately bring joy. Our passage today shows us that the various trials that grieve us in this world are real, and yet joy is possible through all circumstances. Joy is possible when it is rooted in something more real, more permanent, something even more beautiful than our suffering is tragic. So I I just have two points today. We see in this passage that we can have joy in the midst of suffering and we can have joy in so great a salvation. So first, joy in the midst of suffering. Verse six, in this you rejoice. What does this refer to? Well, if you missed my sermon last week, it's worth looking back on the preceding verses in which Peter describes that we've been born again to a living hope through Jesus' resurrection. As long as Jesus is alive, our hope is alive. We've been born again to an inheritance that is lasting. It is sure because God is keeping it in heaven for us and keeping us for it. An inheritance, not something earned, but a gift based on a relationship. We will be treated as God's own children, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, You've been grieved by various trials. Nowhere does the Bible deny the realities of grief or sadness in this world. Fleming Rutledge writes that religious systems, and we might add secular systems as well, that ignore the dark side of life are fundamentally dishonest. She goes on, the authentic hope of a Christian does not consist in looking away from the darkness, but in looking straight into it. And if I might add, Christian hope and joy consist in looking through, beyond the darkness, to the light that's coming. Our joy does not consist in turning a blind eye to reality, nor in downplaying the harsh realities of the world, but in seeing through them, seeing beyond them. I've heard a lot of people in our present moment uh, say things like, well, I hope this, uh, this outbreak, this quarantine will all be over soon. Now, I hope I'm wrong, but right now, sadly, there's no indication that that will be the case. And I say this because uh, false hope is really no hope at all and ends up actually causing greater suffering. There's this scene in uh, The Silver Chair, one of the Chronicles of Narnia books. Yes, we're going back to Narnia for a second time. Uh, There's a scene in which the children with their companion Puddleglum are on this journey to find the lost prince and they're trekking through this cold and dreary wasteland when this beautiful, pleasant woman comes to meet them. And she tells them of a castle that's not far away where they'll find a warm welcome, steaming baths, soft beds, and warm meals served four times a day. But what the children don't realize is that she's actually their enemy. She's the witch who has disguised herself and fooled them. And so from that point on in their journey, since they could only think of warm meals and soft beds coming soon, it actually made things much worse. 
They forgot about their mission and Aslan. They became more grumpy and irritable towards each other. They felt sorry for themselves and had less ability to deal with adversity than before they had talked with the disguised witch. False hope actually causes greater suffering. Pastor Jack Miller once wrote, those who suffer most are those who think they shouldn't be suffering. So Peter writes to the scattered and suffering exiles of Asia Minor, basically saying, don't think that because you're God's children, that all this means that, that there won't be troubles in this life. The consistent message of the Bible is not that God will remove our troubles in this life or remove us from our troubles, but that God has given or will give us all that we need to have jo a joy that will endure the various trials of this life. And he does this by entering into our suffering and enduring it and overcoming it redeeming it in order to one day eradicate it completely. But in this life, in this fallen world, we should expect to be grieved by various trials. Some of you may have come across an article uh, from the Harvard Business Review written within the last couple of weeks called that, Discom that Discomfort You're Feeling is Grief. It's an interview with uh, David Kessler, who's one of the world's uh, foremost experts on grief, in which he says that many of us are going through the five stages of grief right now. There's denial, which we say a lot of early on, this virus won't affect us. There's anger. You're making me stay home and taking away my activities. There's bargaining. Okay, if I social distance for two weeks, everything will be better, right? There's sadness. I don't know when this will end. And finally, there's acceptance. This is happening. I have to figure out how to proceed. Kessler has more recently co-authored a book with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the, the uh, creator of this five stages of grief framework, in which they've added a sixth stage of grief. And that sixth stage is finding meaning. From a biblical perspective, there's, there's much to affirm here. Uh, both in the article that's been circulating and in this six-stage process of grief more generally. When one is grieving, they don't need to be hit over the head with out-of-context Bible verses about being content in all circumstances. Being joyful does not mean that we're always happy and chipper. It's okay to be sad. What they need is to grieve, to lament, and to have others sit with them in their grief, as Job's friends did at first, and as the daughter-in-laws of Naomi in the Bible did. Many Christians feel like they're somehow being unfaithful if they allow themselves to be sad and lament. As Sun Chan Ra points out, this is reflected by a contemporary Christian worship culture that is heavily slanted towards feel-good songs when the Bible is filled with lament, over one third of the Psalms are songs of lament. The Psalms teach us over and over again to bring all of our emotions to God in prayer, to move toward God in times of grief, not away from him, even in our anger and frustration. And once we have properly grieved and are healing, then we can begin to look for meaning in our suffering. Now, if you believe that life is uh, random in its origin and random in what happens, I don't know how you find any meaning in times of trouble. But the Christian hope revealed in the Bible not only provides comfort in times of loss, but provides meaning as well. Now, as Miroslav Wolf points out, every time we ascribe positive meaning to suffering, we do so in hope. Much of the meaning of our suffering will be unknown in this life, but there is the hope that its meaning will be revealed to us in the life to come. Here in our passage, we are given 
uh, some resources for meaning. We're given four reasons why we can not only endure, but actually have joy in the midst of our trials. First, because our hope in Christ points beyond the trials of this life. Our present suffering from the perspective of eternity is very brief. It's only verse six for a little while, even if it may seem to last forever when we're immersed in it. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Now he's not downplaying the trials of this world. Paul and Peter, all the Christians of this time, were well acquainted with the reality of suffering. But he's reminding the church that in light of an eternity lived with the Lord in which there will be no suffering, this present suffering is short-lived, momentary, a blip on the radar screen of an internal existence, which is not to say that this life is insignificant, but it is to say that it ought to be viewed through the lens of eternal life. The African-American minister Howard Thurman gave a series of famous lectures at Boston University in the 1950s, demonstrating how in the time of slavery, the African-American spirituals, uh, often so otherworldly, uh, fixed on their hope in heaven, gave slaves the strength and hope to endure their present suffering in this life. This life may be filled with suffering, unjust suffering, but a better life is coming and it will last far longer. Second, we, have, uh, we can not only endure but have joy in suffering because when we endure trials, our faith is strengthened and purified. The picture that we have here in verse seven is of gold being tested by fire. In this time, there was nothing as valuable as gold. And so as you might imagine, there were many counterfeits. And so the way that gold was tested and uh, discovered to be either true gold or a fake was by fire. Some will face trials in life, and those trials will reveal that they did not have true faith, but, were, but only had a superficial profession of Jesus that was there when life was easy, but non-existent when things turned difficult. For others, the fiery trial will reveal the genuineness of their faith. And not only that, but the fire will strengthen their faith. Now, this may be a painful process. We root our joy, our hope in so many different things, fluctuating and impermanent things. And this process is often the stripping away of these things that we find our hope in. But faith is that which attaches us to the Lord, the only unchanging thing in life. Therefore, faith is more precious than gold. Often we see trials that come as punishments from God. But what this is saying is that there are trials that can be not punishments, but gifts. Now, hear me out here. I don't want to make this, this is not a universal statement, as there are, are various kinds of trials. The, the text acknowledges that. But some trials can be a gift in that they deepen our faith. They purify our faith. It's only when those other things that we're placing our hope in are stripped away that we learn that Jesus is all we need. As Pastor Juan Sanchez has put it so well, suffering takes nothing that you need because Christ is all you need. Third reason we can rejoice in trials, as we share in Christ's suffering, we share in his glory. Our enduring the trials, verse 7, may result in glory and honor and praise at the coming of Jesus Christ. We have this idea that if we're suffering, God must have abandoned us. We must not be in God's will. Peter at one point thought this too. 
When Jesus described what being the Messiah would entail, that he must suffer many things and be killed and then rise, Peter says, no, Lord, I will never let that happen to you. And as the gospel story unfolds, it's Peter who's committed to not letting Jesus and not letting himself suffer. And for that, Jesus rebukes Peter, saying that his attempt to keep Jesus from suffering is from Satan, that he's not setting his mind on the things, on the, the kingdom of God, but on the things, on the kingdom of man. We, like Peter, often want to avoid suffering because our minds are set on the things of this world. But Peter writing this letter years after Jesus' death and resurrection, can look back and can see and can instruct his readers that suffering does not demonstrate God's absence. If anything, it's the opposite. God is near to the brokenhearted. As we sung earlier, Psalm 46, God is a very present help in times of trouble. He's right there with us when we suffer. Suffering is not a sign that God has abandoned us or that he is no longer Lord, but it's actually a sign of our union with Christ. Jesus followed God perfectly, and he suffered unjustly. Becoming a Christian does not decrease our trials, as many tend to think. If anything, trials are the inevitable results of following Christ like the wake behind a boat, as one commentator put it. But following Christ gives us the resources not only to endure, but to rejoice in trials when they come. Those who have suffered with him have confidence at his coming, verse 7, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This brings us to the fourth reason we can rejoice in trials, the hope that God will redeem our suffering. When Jesus comes, he will bring far more than just an end to suffering. He will redeem it. Verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Peter had seen Jesus, of course, but his readers the distant and scattered uh, Jews and Gentiles of Asia Minor, uh, Jew and Gentile Christians of Asia Minor, they had never seen Jesus. But this is what, excuse me, this is what faith enables to see and to love things yet unseen. After all, we don't see the uh, invisible enemy of the coronavirus, though we see its evidence. Our faith in God is the same way. We see the evidence of God, though we don't physically see him. And the ultimate outcome of our faith, this word telos, the end or purpose of our faith, is the salvation of our souls. And the word soul here, it, it means the whole person, not just the spirit uh, without the body. The ultimate end of faith in Christ is the total redemption of both body and soul, the holistic salvation of the human person. The literary scholar Leland Riken has described uh, the, U, the U-shaped plot uh, structure of the biblical narrative, that, that the Bible begins in harmony, descends into disharmony through the fall and human rebellion but then it ascends again, the resurrection of Jesus being the point at which it begins to ascend again. And it ascends to what Riken calls a higher harmony. Because of the suffering the world has gone through, we, we will have something better than the Garden of Eden, the new Jerusalem, in which God himself is always with us as our light with no possibility of that being taken away or altered. And so our suffering is not meaningless. The Lord has kept a record of our suffering. We're told in Psalm 56 
that God has stored our tears in his bottle. And we see that he wept his own tears over our suffering. As we saw a few weeks ago, Jesus wept and he did something about suffering. For the cross is the ultimate example of God taking suffering, trouble, pain, and using it for his glory and for our good. What was meant for evil, God used for good, that many people would be given life. It's that echo of the end of the Joseph story. This light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Towards the end of uh, Dostoevsky's great novel, The Brothers Karamazov, there's a scene in which two men are discussing the nature of suffering and God. This is really much of the, uh, of the long novel, if you've read it. And Ivan Karamazov, which, which many people think represents Dostoevsky's own view, uh, at one point says this, I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for, that all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage, like the despicable fabrication of the impotent and infinitely small Euclidean mind of man, that in the world's finale at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all hearts for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of all crimes, all the crimes of humanity, for all the blood that they've shed, that it will make it not only possible to forgive, but to justify all that has happened. There will be a higher harmony. Do we dare believe more beautiful than the sufferings of this world are tragic? something so precious that we will know that it was all worth it. The resurrection is the promise and the beginning of God redeeming suffering. And so through what Jesus Christ has done, we can have joy in the midst of suffering. Second, we can have joy in so great a salvation. In this second section of our text, verses 10 through 12, we get a look behind the curtain at, at something so precious as Dostoevsky described it, so great a salvation as the author of Hebrews described it, from the vantage point of first the Old Testament prophets and then the angels in heaven. First the prophets. Verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and subsequent glories. We see that, as one commentator puts it, Jesus is not simply the one of whom the Old Testament prophets speak, but the one who speaks through the prophets. What Jeremiah described as the fire in his bones that urges him not to be silent, Peter identifies here in verse 11 as the spirit of Christ. When we think about it like this, of course the Old Testament points forward to Jesus because in one sense, he is its author. There's such a close and mysterious relationship between the persons of the Trinity that they can be spoken of and often are in the Bible as one and the same. Throughout the Old Testament, we have this promise beginning right after the fall in Genesis 3, of one born of woman who would be bruised by the serpent, but would ultimately crush his head. And running all the way through the Old Testament are these two strands of promises of a good king who would come and reign forever, and prophecies of a suffering servant who would come and vicariously suffer for us. So when Jesus tells his disciples that he will suffer many things and then be glorified, he's bringing these two strands together and saying, they're both about me. I will suffer, but be glorified and reign forever, just like the Old Testament scriptures said the Messiah would. 
The prophets who predicted these things uh, hundreds, sometimes thousands of years before Jesus searched out and inquired carefully about the person and the time that the Spirit was indicating when predicting the sufferings of the Messiah and his subsequent glories. Peter is writing to the scattered suffering exiles and saying, realize how privileged you are to live in a time when the Messiah has already been revealed. Those prophets who came before you, who you may be tempted to envy, wanted so badly to see what you can now see, how the Messiah, the Christ, would conquer by way of being conquered, how he would be both the crucified and the reigning king. Even to those prophets who wanted so badly to make sense of that uh, messianic message that they carried and spoke, not everything was revealed to them, but it was revealed, verse 12, that they were serving not themselves, but you. How privileged we are in the things that have now been announced to you by through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It's hard to imagine something on the five o'clock news that is so good that all the trials and suffering would be worth it. But that is the kind of good news we are talking about here. Jonathan Edwards, the great uh, 18th century pastor, theologian from the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts once told the story of a servant boy uh, who worked shining the, the shoes of the king's servants. He shined the shoes of the servant who shined the king's shoes. And yet he would consistently do his menial work so joyfully, even enduring mistreatment from the servants above him. He lived with so much contentment while those servants around him would complain that one day, one of the servants who had a higher position uh, came to him and asked, don't you know that you are lower than low, that you are the servant of the servant of the king? Why is it that you have such joy? And the boy smiled and said, because I know something you don't know. One day the king came to me. He spoke to me by name and promised me that everything that he had would one day be mine. And then Edward says to his congregation, would it be enough to give you lasting joy if you knew these three things, that the king has come, that he has called you by name, and he has promised to give you all that he has. Friends, that is what the good news promises us. Not that we will never suffer in this world, not that our trials aren't real, but that there is something more real, more lasting, more beautiful than the suffering of this world is tragic. The great minister and hymn writer John Newton once wrote, the gospel is good news that makes the worst things bearable and the best things leavable. We are privileged to live in a time when the sufferings the suffering and reigning Christ has already revealed himself. And we are privileged even in comparison to the angels in heaven. The final image that Peter gives is the angels longing. This word here indicates an over desire. They're desperate to see. They're stooping, craning their necks to see how a perfect God was going to accomplish salvation for an imperfect people, a sinful people. It's Palm Sunday, a day on which we celebrate Jesus' victorious entrance into Jerusalem as the crowd did. But we must also acknowledge that like the crowd, our affections quickly change. Those who are shouting Hosanna to Jesus on Sunday were shouting crucify him by Friday. Jesus was not surprised by this. It was people such as these that he came into the world to rescue. Shortly after he had entered Jerusalem at the end of, of Matthew 23, he would look out over the city and he would cry out, 
Jerusalem, Jerusalem. This repetition is an indication of both love and sadness. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children under my wings as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. This is one of the most vivid illustrations in the whole Bible. Throughout the animal world, mothers are known to defend and protect their young, but maybe none to the extent of the mother hen. Many farmers in, in many different places around the world have recorded similar occurrences in cases of a barnyard fire. There are recorded instances of a mother hen faced with a fire, collecting her young chicks under her wings to keep them safe. And sometimes if the mother hen is successful, once the fire has died down, you will find a dead hen completely roasted, but with the chicks underneath her wings still alive and completely unharmed. So what is it that Jesus is saying he wants to do? As the spirit of Christ had prompted Isaiah to say hundreds of years earlier, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace and joy fell upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. He shielded us. All the punishment that we deserved landed on Jesus so that all the glory that he deserved would be shared with us a spectacle for both humans and angels. There is no better news. Even the angels in heaven don't know what it's like to experience the relief, the joy, the liberation, the wonder of being saved by such unimaginable, sacrificial, wondrous love. To the extent that we root our joy in this, so great a salvation, our joy will be able to endure any and all trials in this life. We pray with me. Lord, what wondrous love is this? Would you cause our uh, hearts to be lifted up in worship as we uh, grieve the various trials that we are faced with in our present moment? Would we know, uh, would we look forward in hope and in joy to the world to come in which you will make all things new? We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.